name is Pastor Greg here in the Holy Land, sitting in front of the city of Jerusalem. Is this not a perfect shot? Behind me, you can see the Dome of the Rock right there. And here's the Dome of my head, quite similar actually. But uh, we want to take you on a behind the scenes tour of the city of Jerusalem. something that this city is known for. It's called a falafel. Let's go find one. Come on. All right, let's see. Hey, uh, do you guys have falafels here? I got falafels, I got shawamas, and they're the best in town. Here's why. I don't want to eat here, let's go. Okay. How much is this bread? I shake a lot. One? One, please. What is that? And this is spice. What kind of spice is that? Air and this. Oh, you dip it in. Oh, I see. some of the uh, souvenir shirts of uh, Israel, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, here's the old city, camels, all things that you think of when you think of Israel, sort of like, well, there's Bazooka Joe, Elmo, Tweety Bird, one of the first ones I've always thought of. And then let's not forget Batman and Spider-Man. It's all here. actually means city of peace, which is a bit ironic, considering the fact that more wars have been fought at the gates of this city than any other city on the face of the globe. But God has said of Jerusalem in 1 Kings 11:36, it's a city where he has chosen to put his name. Jerusalem is the nerve center of the world geographically. Jerusalem is the salvation center of the world spiritually. Jerusalem is the storm center of the world prophetically. And finally, Jerusalem is the glory center of the world ultimately. And God has told us to specifically pray for this city. We're told in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. May there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. Jerusalem is the city of our past, our present, and our future. First, Jerusalem is a city of our past. What you're looking at is a city that's been rebuilt many, many times. Whenever a, a new group would come in, uh, they would usually burn down what was built and build something on top of it. So this is quite different looking than what it would have looked like in ancient biblical times, but at the same time, you get a sense of it. There's so much history in this city. Jerusalem, of course, was the capital of Israel under King David. And it was here that the first temple was built under the direction of David's son, Solomon. And then, of course, we know that moving forward historically that the Jews rebelled against God and they were ultimately sent into captivity, uh, captivity into Babylon for 70 years. And then Nehemiah, along with Ezra, were involved in the rebuilding of the walls again. You remember that Nehemiah, uh, who was the cupbearer of the king Artaxerxes, got permission to come and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And at night he rode around the circumference of the walls and saw the burned charred ruins and came up with a plan. And everyone built 
the portion of the wall that was near to their home. Now fast forwarding many years, we have the Roman occupation of Jerusalem, of course, and then we have the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus spent quite a bit of time in Jerusalem. In fact, it was here on this mountain where I am now, the Mount of Olives, looking into Jerusalem that he gave the Olivet Discourse. Of course, he went into Jerusalem and drove the money changers out of the temple on two separate occasions. It was into Jerusalem. He rode on the back of that donkey and ultimately went to the cross of Calvary and was crucified. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks. He wept because he knew of the destruction that was coming. Because after Christ was crucified, Titus and the Roman legions came in in 70 AD and basically burned the temple to the ground. By the way, fulfilling a prophecy that Christ gave on the Mount of Olives when he said there would not be one stone left upon another in the temple. He said it would be dismantled and it was done exactly as Jesus said. Jerusalem is a city of the past. But Jerusalem is also the city of the present. When the Jews formed their nation here in Israel on May 14, 1948, it was a modern day miracle and a fulfilled prophecy that set the prophetic clock ticking. Consider this, never has there been a nation that's been able to maintain its national identity three to 500 years after being removed from its homeland, that is, until Israel. They were scattered to the four corners of the earth. And then after the horrors of the Holocaust, the Jews began to return to their homeland and officially became a nation. But God says that Jerusalem would be at the center of the world conflicts in the end times. And yet Israel was not able to get control of Jerusalem until 1967. So Israel was back in the land, fulfilling the prophecies of Ezekiel, where he spoke of a valley of dry bones and flesh coming out of the bones and coming alive again. And that is what Israel is today. But yet God said that Jerusalem would play a key role in the end time scenario. And yet Israel did not have control of their eternal capital, Jerusalem, until the Six Day War in 1967. So that brought everything together, Jerusalem the city of our past, the city of our present, and Jerusalem is the city of the future. It is here, right where I am now, that world history as we know it will come to an end. Jerusalem will be at the center of the final conflict as the battle of Armageddon rages and the Bible teaches that when Christ comes back again, his foot will set down on the Mount of Olives and it will cleave from the east to the west and he will enter in through the east gate of the wall of Jerusalem that is behind me. The scripture also tells us that God would make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness and a burdensome stone for all people. This is yet to come, an amazing city. And yet God has told us, as I mentioned earlier, to pray for her peace. You know, the ultimate peace that Jerusalem needs to see will not come until the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom on this earth. I hope you all can come someday to Israel and take a Holy Land tour, but I have good news for you. Even if you're not able to come and board a bus and join us on one of these tours someday, you will go on a Holy Land tour. Because when Christ comes back to this earth, the Bible says he's going to return with his saints riding with him. That's even better than a guided tour on a bus. So until that day, we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem and praying for the Jewish people. So let's take a walk together through Jerusalem. We shot this very early in the morning, and I'm retelling the story of what happened on the day that Jesus died. And then we're going to focus specifically on the seven statements of Christ from the cross. path that was walked on 
when Jesus Christ was in the city of Jerusalem. At this point, he's been sent to be crucified by Pontius Pilate. Jesus was a carpenter. He was a man's man. He knew how to put his shoulder to a task. But after being scourged, whipped with a Roman cat of nine tails, 39 times, it was a tremendous loss of blood. Yet he shoulders his cross and he carries it through the streets of Jerusalem. On each side of him, the crowds were screaming and yelling. They wanted this bloodbath. And they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And they got exactly what they wanted. But as Jesus was carrying his cross, he fell beneath the weight of it. It was too much. And there was a man who happened to be in Jerusalem during the Passover named Simon from Cyrene. He was ordered by one of the Roman guards to pick up the cross of Jesus and carry it for him. And for a brief moment in time, Jesus experienced a little relief from the pressure of carrying his own cross. You know, if I could have been anyone in the biblical story, I think maybe on that day I would have chosen to be Simon. You know, it would have been great to be one of the others perhaps, but Simon had a privilege. He had the privilege of carrying the cross of Jesus Christ. But you know what? We all have that privilege. You know, Jesus said, if any man comes after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever seeks to save his life, will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you find it. No, we don't carry literal crosses anymore, but when we deny ourselves, when we put Christ first, we have the same privilege that Simon the Cyrenian had, and we carry the cross of Jesus through the road of life. The Bible says they took him to a place called the place of the skull, or Calvary, and there they crucified him. Scripture does not give us a lot of detail about crucifixion, reason being everyone was familiar with it. If you were a citizen of Jerusalem, it was not an uncommon sight to see a man carrying his cross of the streets with guards from Rome on each side. When you saw a man with a cross, you knew that man was going to die. But as we look back now through archaeology and through history, we learn a lot about crucifixion and we understand how barbaric and horrific it actually was. Crucifixion actually originated in Persia where they did it so the criminal would be raised above the earth in order to not defile it. It was actually Alexander the Great that introduced the practice to Egypt and Carthage and the Romans probably adapted it from the Carthaginians. See, the whole point of crucifixion was not to merely kill a man. There were a lot of more, well, shall I say, efficient ways to do that. Strangulation, beheading, hanging. No, crucifixion was designed to torture someone. It was designed to bring the most pain possible. That's why the Romans crucified people and lined the streets leading into Roman provinces with crucified men. It was a warning which simply said, don't mess around with Rome. But here's the thing. The Romans didn't realize it, but they were fulfilling Bible prophecy. Psalm 22 says, they pierced my hands and my feet. And that is exactly how Jesus died. What's amazing is when that particular statement was written down, that was years before crucifixion even existed, yet it was so graphic in his detail. Isaiah tells us in chapter 53 that his body was so beaten and traumatized you could not even tell he was a man. And then Jesus himself spoke repeatedly about the fact that he was going to be crucified. This was the plan and the purpose of God. For one rare moment in human history, God and Satan had a similar objective. God wanted Jesus to go and die for the sin of the world, fulfilling all of the types, all of the pictures given to us in the Old Testament where the lamb would be slain on behalf of the people. Satan wanted Jesus to be put to death so he could stop his ministry. But of course, the Father had a purpose in all of these things that were about to happen. For the Bible says, it pleased the Father to bruise him. Jesus was taken to the place of the skull known as Calvary, Golgotha. He was laid out upon that crude wooden cross, as I said, with his back already ripped open. Iron spikes were pounded through his hands and feet, and then the cross was hoisted up and dropped into the ground. 
Death by crucifixion was essentially death by suffocation. It was designed to prolong the agony of the pain, but at the same time ultimately result in death. And there Jesus hung on the cross. This is the Via Della Rosa. It means the way of pain. About 30 feet below, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ walked this very street carrying his cross on the way to be crucified for the sin of the world. After they took Jesus to the cross and pounded the nails through his hands and feet, he gave the first of seven statements, each one important. The first statement of Jesus from the cross was actually a prayer. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It would have made more sense to us if he would have prayed for himself, <laughs> maybe praying what was a later statement from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But no, his first statement was a prayer, and not just a prayer, but it was a prayer for his enemies, for the very people that had done this to him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, they don't even realize the immensity of what they've just done. They have committed a sin that is so black they don't understand how horrible it is. Father, he prays, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hey, listen, Jesus practiced what he preached. What he said one day on the sunny Mount of Beatitudes telling his followers to love their enemies and to pray for those that despitefully used them and persecuted them. He was now putting into practice as he hung on the cross of Calvary. Love your enemies, Jesus said. So what do we see from this statement of Christ from the cross? Well, for one thing, we see that no one is beyond the reach of prayer. Can you think of someone right now that you cannot imagine ever being a follower of Jesus Christ? I would challenge you to start praying for that person by name. No one is beyond the reach of God's hand. And so Jesus was praying for the people that did this very thing to him. Can you pray for someone who has hurt you, who has wronged you? I think you ought to. So, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is a statement of Jesus. Now here's an interesting thing. In one gospel account, we read that both criminals crucified on each side of him joined the chorus of mockery from the onlooking spectators. A word about the so-called thieves on the cross. The King James Version calls them that, but the word that is used to describe the kind of criminal they were is far more severe. They were probably insurrectionists or murderers, those who were engaged in trying to overthrow Rome, and that's why they were being dealt with in such a harsh way, because the Romans wanted to make an example out of anyone who would dare to defy their power. So, two hardened criminals crucified on each side of him. They had heard it all, seen it all, and probably had done it all. But then Jesus gives his first statement from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And right there on the spot, one of those hardened criminals believes. He had never seen anything like this before. I mean, think of all that he had been exposed to in his life to bring him to a place where he was now, where he was dying for his sins and his crimes. But yet, to hear a man who had been treated even worse than him because we don't know that those thieves had been scourged. Here's Jesus. He's been whipped and scourged and beaten in addition to being crucified. And he's innocent. And yet he says to the Father, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That thief believes right on the spot. And he turns to the Lord. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus then gives the second statement from the cross, which, by the way, was the answer to a prayer. First statement was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, a prayer. Second statement, an answer now to that man's request. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, today you will be with me in paradise. And he pardoned him that day, and now he had hope beyond the grave.
One of the most touching statements showing the real humanity and concern of Jesus as he was hanging on the cross was when he said, Woman, behold your son. There was Mary standing at the foot of the cross. It's hard to imagine the anguish of a mother's heart to see her beloved son, aged 33, beaten beyond human recognition. And yet he remembers her. Woman, behold your son. Then looking to the apostle John, standing nearby, he says, Son, behold your mother. It is believed by most commentators that Joseph, the husband of Mary, had died at this point, and Jesus, being the eldest son, had been caring for her, as was the culture of the day. But now that Jesus had completed his ministry on earth and was about to ascend to the Father after his resurrection, he was entrusting the care of his mother to the apostle John. Son, behold your mother. So Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He turned to the one thief who came to his senses and said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Now Matthew's account picks the story up. Now about the sixth hour until the ninth hour. That would be 12 noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There was darkness all over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which means, of course, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did Jesus say that? Well, because it was true. You see, Jesus was forsaken that I might be forgiven. Yes, it's true. Jesus was bearing all of the sins of the world, all of my sins, all of your sins, and that moment of time, and the Father whose face is so pure that he cannot look an evil turned away as all of that sin was placed on Christ who became sin for us. So Jesus was simply describing the accuracy of the situation. He was simply saying what was actually transpiring in the moment. This was God's most painful moment. Oh sure, the scourging was brutal. Oh sure, the crucifixion was unbelievably painful. But nothing caused more pain to Jesus than having to bear the sin of the world. Why? Because he had never sinned. He was God. Yes, he was fully human, but he was also fully God. That means that he never did one thing wrong. Can you imagine? He never even had a single thought out of harmony with the Father. And then for him to take all the sin of the world for Jesus, it was a fate worse than death. And why did he do this? Because of love. It wasn't nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was love for you and for me. The Apostle Paul summed it up perfectly when he said, He loved me and he gave himself for me. And he loves you and gave himself for you. Then Jesus makes his first statement from the cross of a personal nature. He says, I thirst. <laughs> I mean, imagine this. This is the creator of the universe, God Almighty, the one who made water saying, I thirst. But through the tremendous loss of blood and all that he had gone through, he was simply describing the accuracy of the situation. It's a good reminder that though Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. That meant that he bled real blood and he felt real pain. Is your body racked with pain? So is his. Have you been abandoned and forsaken by friends? So is he. Are you in need? He was feeling great pain at this time. All of this happened to remind us that Jesus Christ was a man. And the Bible says we have a high priest that was touched in all points as we are, yet without sin. He felt it. He's been there. He's done that. He's the only one who could say, I feel your pain. He knows what you're going through right now. It was at this point that Jesus gave what is often described as the battle cry of the cross. He said, it is finished. That word finished comes from a word, tetelestai. That was a common word used in these days. It was used by people to describe the 
completion of a task. If you were a carpenter and you finished a table, you would say tetelestai. If the meal was cooked to eat, you would say tetelestai. Jesus takes the same word and uses it to describe what he has just done. Tetelestai, it is finished. Or another way you can translate it, it is completed. Or even another way you can translate it, it is fulfilled. You see, Jesus had completed the work his Father had called him to do. He had fulfilled the purpose and the plan of God. And now the sin of the world has been paid for as he has finished the job he had come to do. So what was finished? Well, for starters, finished was the horrendous suffering of Jesus. Never again would he experience pain or be in the hands of Satan. Never again would he bear the sins of the world. Never again would he even for a moment be forsaken of God. Also finished was Satan's stronghold on humanity. The Bible says in Hebrews 2.14, through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Listen, because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, no one has to be a slave of sin of any kind. They don't have to be under the power of a vice or an addiction or a lifestyle or anything else. Why? Because Jesus said, it is finished. Finished is the power of sin in the life of the person who has put their complete faith in Jesus Christ. And finally, finished is our salvation. There is nothing that you or I need to do to add on to the work that has already been done by Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary to tell us die. It is finished. After this, Jesus gave his seventh and final statement from the cross, which was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The King James says Jesus gave up the ghost. That simply means he died. Voluntarily, I might add. No one took his life from him. He laid it down of his own accord. A Roman soldier took a spear and thrust it into his side. And John's Gospel tells us that water and blood came out. That probably was indicating the fact that the pericardium, which is that sac surrounding the heart, was pierced, simply saying, Jesus clearly was dead, but only temporarily. So they took the dead, lifeless body of Jesus and they placed it in an airless tomb belonging to a man named Joseph of Arimathea. They never thought they would see Jesus Christ again. But he rose again from the dead three days later. Right here in Jerusalem is where it all happened. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So what does that mean to you? Two thousand years ago is a long time. One might wonder, what do these events that happened so long ago have to do with, with us living in the 21st century? The answer is they have a lot to do with us because these events that happen inside of this city and on the outskirts of it here in Jerusalem forever change the world. And these events, they can change your life as well. And outside of the city wall of Jerusalem here, and as we thought about all that Jesus went through, how he walked these streets, how he carried his cross, how he was nailed on it, how outside of the walls of this city, Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, and then he ascended to heaven. Consider this, he's alive. Even though we're talking about events that happened here in Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago, these events impact you because the same Jesus who lived, who died, who rose here is with you where you are right now standing at the door of your life. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Jesus Christ wants to come into your life and forgive you of all of your sin. That's why he died on the cross. Because there was no other way for us to be forgiven for all the wrongs, for all the sins that we have committed. So Jesus paid the price for us. Jesus Christ paid a debt he did not owe because you owed a debt you could not pay. Would you like Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sin? 
Would you like your guilt taken away? Would you like to know with certainty that when you die, you will go to heaven? If so, why don't you pray with me right now, this simple prayer, and this is where you're asking Jesus to come into your life. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud right now with me, if you would. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but you died on the cross and you shed your blood for every sin I have ever committed. I turn from that sin now and I put my faith in you. Be my Savior, be my Lord, be my God, be my friend. I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this day forward. In your name I pray, amen. If you just prayed that prayer in a minute, on the authority of God's Word, I want to tell you that Christ Himself has come to live inside of you. The Bible says, these things we write to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God.